Okay, um, did you have an announcement to make? I just was hoping <sighs> that Adele would be here, but she's not. Okay, <laughs> if she turns up, I'll, I'll tell her. Uh, if tell she her to do this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I haven't okay. seen her in class for weeks. Yeah, I think she's got a million assignments due. Yeah. Um, did you enter? I didn't notice if you've entered or not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you want to enter? Probably only as a pair, I reckon, but like. What, what are the cash prizes again? $10,000 for the top pair. That's $5,000 for the top pair. Individual, yeah. You got to win across like thirty-four universities, though. Right? It's pretty tough. Yeah, I'd be lucky to win across thirty-four students. I've <laughs> <laughs> got more than thirty-four students entered from the ANU. Yeah. Um, you. What was I going to say? Um, oh, yeah. 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 Enter if you want. I can still take entries until ten a.m. tomorrow. If you really want to go. <laughs> Unlikely, but in case I get drunk and decide to enter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, yeah. let's get started. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, I was telling uh, I was telling Griff that uh, on the Saturday morning, maybe I should just drive out there first thing in the morning and collect you guys from the finish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'd be so so grateful <laughs> <laughs> to sit down for six hours. Is there a run on or something? What's the inward bound is happening next weekend. What's what's the inward bound? Uh, we're we're okay. out to Byron Bay. Uh, analysis now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we can tell you about inward bound at the end. Um, okay, so um, we had some leftover problems from last time where it's grouping various things up. So uh, the, uh, the lemma that uh, fixes things or makes things work much better is just a slight strengthening of something that we did before. So here, uh, TN uh, sequence an increasing sequence of, uh, of self-defined operators uh, and say they're all bounded by some fixed S uh, then uh, there is uh, a smallest self-adjoint operator so it's basically, basically we're saying that supremums exist looking at self adjoint operators. So there's a smaller self adjoint operator uh, T uh, so that uh, T is bigger than all of the TNs um, and it's the small and, and when we say that there's the smallest one we mean that there is a T that's bigger than all the TNs and any other self adjoint operator which is also bigger than all the TNs is bigger than this guy. Okay, so just like the definition of this one. Okay. Uh, and moreover, uh, in that case, the TNs uh, converge strongly. Okay, and so uh, let's leave aside exactly how you prove that. It's actually pretty similar to what uh, to the to the lemma about uh, increasing sequences of self adjoint operators that we talked about last time. Do things in the right order, and you also get this out pretty cheaply at the end. And so then the, the corollary of this, which is what we were we'd be naming for, is this. So if uh, Fn uh, is a bounded uh, increasing sequence of functions uh, on uh, on the spectrum of some operator. Uh, and, sorry, I need to say, uh, so all of the functions individuals, well, they're bounded and they're all measurable functions, so let's you know, I'll say that. Uh, and then let's just f be the supremum of all of those fn's. Uh, then uh, the f of t is just the supremum of the fn of t's the supremum in, in sort of the sense implied by, by this lemma. And so in particular, this lemma is telling us that uh, the, the, the things actually convert strongly to the supremum. So we get, uh, uh, so we get this thing that we want. Okay, 
Now, let's just spend a moment more on this. Uh, how do we... Uh, how do we... So, um, the, so the, the point here is that, uh, we, okay, let, let, let's actually just show directly uh, also that, that we get this from convergence. So here, um, if we look at um, Fn of t uh, applied to I'm very upset now because the the proof that I just wrote in the lecture notes that I was about to post online all nicely PDF'd of this, now that I think about it, is not a proof of that at all. <laughs> I'm totally confused, but okay. Um, uh, so the thing that I wanted to do, and let's see if Let's see if we can reconstruct what on earth I was doing. Was that, I mean, how did we define, uh, well, what did, what did this even mean uh, when Fn is some uh, Borel measurable function? The point was that, um, that uh, if we looked at this uh, for some fixed x. This is uh, a, uh, a bounded linear functional on, uh, on the spectrum of t. And in fact, it's positive uh, if you have a um, Uh, okay, so, so this is certainly some bounded linear functional on, on, on continuous functions in the spectrum. Okay. And now, uh, the point is that uh, a positive uh, continuous function uh, has a square root. Uh, and so if, if f is positive, then you can write this as uh, take the square root of that operator and then square it, and then you can just move one of the square roots across. Okay, so this is, uh, so, and then that's greater than or equal to zero. So this thing is, uh, is a positive functional. Stuff, stuff we did before, just before the break, uh, there's an associated rate operation. Okay, but it depends, and it depends on this uh, that new x. Okay, so then uh, how is this even defined? Fn of t acting on x in a product x for, for a Borel function, for a bounded Borel function, is just defined to be the integral over the spectrum of fn of lambda integrated with respect to whatever that measure was that we 
we've got from the vector x. And now, uh, now what we can say is that that, so we're back thinking about this corollary here, that converges uh, to the integral over the spectrum of, um, of f of lambda d mu x, and that's just the monotone convergence theorem now, okay? We had uh, this bounded increasing sequence converging up to f, okay? So that's the monotone convergence theorem. But of course, that by definition was, uh, was these guys, okay? And uh, I guess the, the bit that, now I, now I see why I was getting so confused, I sort of left out a little part of this lemma which was somehow obvious when you, in the proof of the lemma, but needs to be said separately, if not if you can take in the statement, that uh, x equals uh, the supremum, oh, let's say this differently, t is equal to the supremum of some tn's, so that's in this situation here, uh, if and only if uh, txx uh, is the supremum of tnxx. This, this, this should be a sort of added little statement on the lemma. And then the point here is doing these calculations here, uh, and particularly using the monotone convergence theorem, is proving this condition holds, and so it's proving that f of t really is the supremum. And then the fact that this lemma told you that the tn's converge strongly to t is what tells you that the fn of t is a convergence strongly to t. Okay. Um, Sorry, I got the order there wrong. But hopefully, ideally, you believe everything that was on this board except for the fact that we never we didn't prove this lemma. Um, but since we've spent a lot of time on this, and this lemma is something that I have actually written down a careful proof of in the notes now, let's finally quit this and get on to more interesting things. Okay. Um, does anyone want to ask any questions about the logic there? So the, there's this lemma that fact characterizing when you're the supremum. This calculation showed that if you have functions, for all functions fn converging up to f, then these inner products really do converge up to that inner product. So fn of t really is, so, so, so f of t really is the supremum of fn t. And so the final bit of this lemma gives you strong convergence. And that's finally how we actually try and do the calculations when we want to take real functions. Okay, so the thing that I really wanted to do today, and we will still do, uh, is the multiplier version of the spectral theorem. So let's quickly try and stick the statement up on the board and then uh, try and improve it. So the statement was, T D of H is bounded in the self adjoint. Uh, there exists a measure space, uh, a function in L infinity, and a unitary uh, from H to L2, so that uh, the original operator is just given by go across to the L2 space multiply by that function f, and then come back to the, the Hilton space. Okay. So and this is like the meant to be uh, diagonalization. Okay. So before we actually prove this, let's, um, let's see that this uh, really easily, if we have this fact, uh, this implies the spectral theorem as we've understood it before. Maybe, did I say this last time? I forget. Maybe I did say this. Um, I mean, you can just define um, for uh, as long as G um, is in uh, uh, is continuous functions on, um, on 
the range of f. Although, because this f here is only defined uh, after changing its value on a set of measure zero, this denominator is L infinity, we're really meant to write here the essential image of f, which we talked about briefly. Uh, the point is that you can define uh, g of t to be u star m g composed with f u, uh, and the point is this gives these continuous functions into B of H. And it's pretty easy to see that it's an algebra homomorphism. You add two functions or you multiply functions. It gives you additions and compositions of uh, identities. So you can recover the continuous functional calculus very easily if you know this back. And in fact, uh, here we could have just said uh, even for uh, for bounded real functions, you can just recover. You could have equally done this with g just being any bounded real function. This still would have worked because g was bounded. Uh, uh, you still got uh, some other L infinity function here. Okay? Uh, and so that would define the whole functional calculus. Okay, so we need to understand how you actually produce this crazy measure space and this unitary that makes everything work. And we need a little bit of theory to make this happen. So uh, I have one or two definitions that aren't to do with this first. So we say x uh, is cyclic for some operator in B of H. Uh, if when you look at uh, the span of to the power n applied to x, so that's just all the polynomials in T applied to x, uh, and then you take the closure of that span, that's just in the usual topology on the Hilbert space, uh, if that's the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so if you've got a, if you can find some single vector, so that when you look at all the, the powers of T acting on it, the linear span is dense in the, in the whole Hilbert space. So a quick uh, non-example, of course, uh, let's just... Uh, um, if you have something that's diagonal, uh, and obviously any eigenvector is not cyclic because all of the powers of it are still just multiples of itself. Similarly, uh, if you have some vector that's in some proper eigenspace, then it can't be cyclic. But of course, here, even if we've got this guy um, that has two different eigenvalues. If I pick just something that wasn't in either of the eigenspaces, typically that will be cyclic. Okay, the powers of that guy will actually just expand. Oh. So, uh, okay, then a, uh, a cyclic subspace uh, of H uh, is an invariant subspace. So just meaning that when you restrict your operator t to it, it takes the subspace for itself uh, with a cyclic vector. And technically, when you say it's cyclic vector, you have to specify for which operator you're talking about. But obviously, here we mean t restricted to its invariant subspace. Then it's got a cyclic vector. Okay. So then the lemma, which you're allowed to not believe if you don't believe in the axiom of choice, uh, but then you get sad and this theorem doesn't work anymore. Uh, So, so there's no proof without the axiom of choice? Um, or is it just like a way more messy? Yeah, I, I, I think that as far as I'm aware, this version probably is actually equivalent. You could probably get the axiom of choice back out of it if you really believe this works. Yeah. I, I don't directly see how to do that, but I'm pretty sure that if you don't believe the axiom of choice, the different versions of the spectral theorem we've been talking about might actually don't quote me on that one, but I might get to do that. Okay. Any bounded operator, uh, it can be written. As a direct sum of cyclic subspaces. Uh, can 
anyone tell me a proof? It's really, I mean, if, if you have to use the axiom of choice, and there's almost nothing to do except to use the axiom of choice. Uh, so, I think about Zorn, and then, then maybe someone can give me an, a proof. Uh, so, what's the idea? Well, um, certainly if you've got any Hilbert space, you can just pick some non zero vector in it and look at that the span of the t, the powers of t applied to it. Either that's the whole subspace, and you're done. We didn't even need to write it as a direct sum. We just wrote it as a, the whole thing was a, was a cyclic subspace. Or it's some proper subspace. It's not zero, because the vector x wasn't zero that we, that we picked. Uh, so if you've got something, you can always find a cyclic subspace inside. And so now, all that you're meant to do is look at uh, you have, um, so what, what do we need to say to apply Zorn's lemma? Um, we need to have some, uh, some partially ordered set, which is going to be um, the, so the elements of this partially ordered set are going to be um, um, direct sums of cyclic subspaces that might not fill up the whole space. Okay. Uh, and what do we need to do to apply Zorn's lemma? Well, we need to say that um, if you, and now I'm saying what's the partial order? The partial order is just, uh, if I've got one collection of, of cyclic subspaces and you've got another collection of cyclic subspaces, I'm contained in yours if, if each of my cyclic subspaces is one of your cyclic subspaces and possibly you've got some extra ones as well. And to apply Zorn's lemma, we, um, just need to say that what well, each um, um, uh, that each chain in that partially ordered set has a maximal element, but a chain just means um, the so we've got a whole family of cyclic subspaces, but each one is just a subset of the cyclic subspaces of the next guy. So the maximum element is just a union of all of the subspaces that you see in any of them. And then Zorn says that there's a maximal one, there's one that, that can't be any bigger, but the only way you could have one that can't get any bigger is if it consists of, if, is, if it, if, is if it's the whole space, because otherwise you can take a vector that's not in the direct sum of cyclic subspaces and add something else to it. Okay, all right, Zorn's lemma, that's true. Okay, uh, okay, so we're just gonna do this now. And so through any operator, we, this is just saying we can find some, some collection of vectors, x alpha. I won't say xi because you, well, but no, no, I guess I can say xi because if our Hilbert space is separable, you can find a countable set of x's so that the span, these spans for each of the different xi's give you a whole collection of, of subspaces which add up to the whole Hilbert space. Okay, so, uh, What do we do with that? Well, so say uh, say we've got a cyclic vector, and so essentially, I mean, essentially, the point of this lemma is that uh, we're now just going to. Um, break our Hilbert space up into these cyclic subspaces and really just think about T on each of the cyclic subspaces. So if X uh, is a cyclic vector for, uh, for T, uh, then uh, I can define um, I'm not going to tell you the source and target of you for a moment because I think it'd be a little bit clearer if we don't. But let's define an operator that takes uh, some polynomial in T applied to X and sends it to uh, that whatever that polynomial was. 
Now we've got to be a bit worried here, of course, because um, there might be multiple ways to write a given vector y as p of t times x, q of t times x. Q, two different polynomials could give us the same thing, and then this would not be well defined. So we have to address that in just a moment. Okay, um, so um, so we'll think of this here as u is defined is defined on the span of um, of the powers of t applied to x, and then I want to think of this as that polynomial as a um, well let, let's just think of it as an L two function. On the spectrum of t, and let's use that measure mu x that we were talking about. Remember, mu x was the this is the uh, the measure associated to the continuous linear functional. Same as the continuous function for that. Okay, so. Uh, How do we know that it's even well defined? Well, uh, so first of all, okay, I guess we, we need several claims here. Um, the first claim of this lemma is uh, uh, is u is well defined, and then uh, it's uh, it's bounded. So here, this is just a subspace of our Hilbert space. And that is some, uh, some norm of linear space, just with the L2 norm, so we can talk about it being bounded. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and then if you've got a, a bounded linear map on this, remember x being cyclic means this is dense in the Hilbert space, so we can extend it, so it's extension uh, u from the whole, I'm still gonna call it u, from the whole Hilbert space, to L2 uh, is unitary. And finally, um, let's show that ut u star of g, so where does g live? g is over in this L2 space. u star pulls it back into the Hilbert space, t acts on it as we push it back to the L2 space. So it's a function, so we can evaluate it at some point lambda in the spectrum. And I want to say that that's just lambda times, um, times g of lambda. Okay. And that's for all, uh, for all g and l2. Okay. This lemma has lots of claims, but then it's, it, this does essentially all of the work of the, of the multiplier version of the spectral theorem. So we've got a few things to check here. Uh, what order do we do them in? Um, ah, okay. So, in fact, I think we can, if I've got this right, I think we can kill the first two steps in one go. So, what we can do is look at uh, the norm of P of T applied to X all squared, okay? And so that by definition, well, not by definition, but by using a jointness, uh, is that, oh, I should have moved it the other, I should have put it the other way, given the way we've been doing things so far. Um, let's write it that way. Uh, and then, of course, by definition of this measure mu x, that is the integral over the spectrum of p bar of lambda, uh, p of lambda, integrated with respect to the measure coming from x. And that, of course, by definition, uh, is the square of the L2 norm So, uh, first of all, ignoring well-definedness for a moment, 
that shows that it's, it's bounded, and in fact way better than bounded, it shows that it's actually an isometry. It takes any vector here to a vector with exactly the same norm. Okay, it's norm preserving. And I think hopefully that tells us that it's, um, that it's well defined. Um, yeah, I mean, if, uh, if uh, it just shows us that if u of pt x equals zero, then, um, uh, then the L2 norm of p is zero. So p dates it. Okay, so that gave us a well, that, that same calculation gave us well definedness as well. Okay. Uh, so, um, in fact, in fact, it gives us all the all three claims. Um, an operator preserves norms. Uh, if and only if uh, it's unitary. Uh, it's a great exercise if you haven't already seen it. It's just pretty much from the definition of being unitary. Um, and then we just need to do this calculation here, which is really just an easy calculation now. So we look at ut u star g the number lambda. And now, uh, uh, what are we doing? Uh, oh, uh, okay, so let's, so let's just sort of do one more thing here before we get on to that. Um, the, So when we extend u to all of L2, we also have uh, u of g of t applied to x equals g uh, for all g and L2, okay? Not just, I mean, we, by definition that was true for polynomials, but actually when you extend it, it's true for all L2 functions. And uh, that's just by using the fact <coughs> On the spectrum, the polynomials were just dense in L2. And so the fact that you are preserving norms means that that condition carries through to the extension. Okay, but another way of writing this is equivalently, remember that u is the same as u, u star is the same as u inverse. We proved it was unitary. So equivalently, uh, g of t x equals u star g. And that's how we start the calculation here. Okay, so if this is u t, uh, G applied to T, that's the functional calculus, uh, applying to G times X, sorry, not times X, uh, there's no X, sorry, I left off a, I left off a line here. No, uh, sorry, what have I done here? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 I mean, this, this point X, remember, is our, is our favorite cyclic vector in the Hilbert space. So here, I'm just meant to stick in it. Great. Okay. Uh, and that's still some function in L2, so we still need to have evaluated at lambda. Now we just use a bit more of the functional calculus. So this is the, you, we think of this as the function x goes to x applied to t, and this is g applied to t. So I can change this to u uh, applied to um, the function xg, oh sorry, x is a terrible letter, um, use lambda g, apply to t, apply to x, lambda, okay, just uh, using, the, using the fact that the product of those two operators is the product of the two corresponding functions. And then we use this fact again, and we're done. And then that's just the function lambda g evaluated at lambda, which is of course just lambda. Okay. How do people feel about that?
unless you guys should ask me a question. I mean, do you have to pick the brackets on the second bottom line? Do I have to be are you missing all of them? Am I, mi I probably am missing some brackets here. On all so left? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, you do have to have some brackets there because this is still, this gadget here is an operator in V of H. We're acting on some vector and then we're sending that vector in H across to a vector in L2 by applying U. And then we're evaluating that L2 function at the point line of this. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so with that, uh, the spectral theorem is really easy. So we just write H as the direct sum over I as the spans of T and X I's. Uh, ui going from one of these spans to uh, L2 of sigma t with the measure that came from that particular cyclic vector that we were using for that subspace. Uh, we do that for each i. And then define u to be this map from the direct sum of all of these, uh, which is just h, to the direct sum of all of these, and it's just obviously the, the diagonal guy. This, this infinite diagonal guy that just maps each direct sum and the corresponding guy. So that's a map from our whole original Hilbert space to the direct sum over i of these L2 spaces which are all actually just L2, copies of L2 on the, on the spectrum, but each time with a different measure. And that thing there, you can always think of the direct sum of a bunch of different L2 spaces as a single L2 space on uh, the disjoint union of all of those sets. Okay? Like L2 on the disconnected thing is just an L2 function on one bit and an L2 function on on another bit, uh, well, you've got to be a little bit careful, actually. Um, when, remember when we, when what we mean by an infinite direct sum of Hilbert spaces, we mean a collection of vectors, one in each sum and, but whose norms are square summable. Like, you can't just have something of norm one in every single one of these bits. And that's why you have this equivalence here, because you have an L2 function on each one of these pieces, and the norms are still square summable, and that means that the function on the union of all the sets still counts as an L2 function. And here, it's maybe a little bit unclear what notation you want to use, but I'm just going to write some of these measures, where sort of implicitly here I'm extending each of these measures to the union by saying it's zero on all of the components that it didn't naturally live on, and then I can sum up all of the measures on all the different pieces. Okay. Um, and then we're done. Uh, we're pretty, so we've built a unitary from our Hilbert space to some L2 space. And now what was F? Uh, F, remember, is our, the, the thing that, that we multiply by. Um, so F is just, we take this map from the union of all of these copies of the spectrum uh, to R. Um, and you just do this by the embeddings. I mean, each of these spectra, each of these copies of the spectrum is sitting inside R. So if you want to map of this big disjoint union, if you've got a point in one of the spectrums, you just map to the real numbers by, by including it. And then this calculation here then exactly says the thing that we wanted, that uh, I mean, the fact that um, we, what we just said is that ut, this, you now say this ut u star uh, is exactly uh, multiplication by the function um, um, well let me, by this function f that, that is just uh, uh, taking a point in the spectrum 
and, uh, and, and multiplying. Okay, so one or two little comments about this. Um, actually, each of these individual L2 spaces These are individually uh, finite, may or not the L2 bits, but the pair spectrum common U, X, Y. These are individually uh, finite measure spaces. Uh, since you can just look at the, the integral of the function 1, the U, X, I is just um, the identity operator applied to X in a product X, but just the norm squared of Okay, so each of these individual measure spaces is actually finite measure, and that makes this whole measure space here so this is sigma finite because it's just a uh, and it's pretty obviously a countable union now of, of finite measure spaces. But you have to be a little bit careful there if the Hilbert space you were working with in the beginning of the day wasn't separable when you applied Zorn's lemma to make this huge collection of, uh, of cyclic subspaces, it would have been an uncountable collection rather than a countable collection. So you'd lose sigma finiteness if, if you were foolishly doing operators on a non separable space. Okay, uh, we've got one or two more minutes, so let's um, say the last one or two things I wanted to say about um, Spectral theory, which is just one or two applications. Let me find the page. There we go. Okay, so something that we've already seen, uh, we used a few times, was that um, was that positive operators have square roots. Uh, another cute one uh, is that uh, things like a self-adjoint operator. With spectrum uh, contained in the non-negative reals uh, is positive, and the way that you prove this is just that uh, f of t is positive uh, when f is non-negative, and the way you prove that is just that if you've got some non-negative function, you write f as the square root of f all squared, okay, and that pretty easily tells you that this operator is positive because um, just this calculation I think that we did earlier and then finally this implication here is just that well uh, you can uh, you can say if you just take the function uh, lambda maps to lambda and apply it to the operator t. That's by how our functional calculus has worked. That's just the original operator. But this guy uh, is uh, is a is a non-negative function. On the spectrum, I mean, that was exactly our hypothesis. That the spectrum was only non-negative, so the identity function counts as a non-negative function, and so the operator itself is positive by that trick. Uh, and it's actually, if you try and, well, you can prove this with your bare hands. I mean, you can prove this statement uh, basically the same way that we proved that the spectrum of a self-adjoint operator is contained in the real line. Almost the same argument will, will prove this. But somehow, like, it would be nice to think about this and realize that this is sort of a, a much cheaper argument. You don't need to get your hands dirty to do it. Um, another cute one is that uh, uh, every uh, every bounded operator uh, can be written uh, as a linear combination of, uh, of in fact <coughs> of in fact four unitary operators, which is kind of a surprising fact. Uh, in uh, I mean if uh, 
uh, if h is the complex numbers, can anyone see how to prove this statement? And can you improve four? So let's just think what, what this means if h is the complex numbers. It's even cheaper than that in, in, the, in the complex numbers. Uh, so in the, in the complex numbers, b of c, well, that's just, copy, that's just c again, just multiplication, multiplication by some complex number. So we're just asking, we're just saying every complex number can be written as a linear combination of four unitaries. What are the unitaries in here? The unitaries in C are just, uh, just the unit circle, okay? They're the numbers whose complex conjugate is equal to their inverse. And in fact, everything in the complex plane can be written as a linear combination of a single unitary, because you can write everything as some real scalar times something on the unit circle. So you can do a lot better back there in C, but it turns out four is enough. Uh, so the, there are two steps here. So first of all, you can write T as um, T plus um, um, T star minus, um, well, so, so this guy is self adjoint. Uh, unfortunately, Two there, divide by two here. Unfortunately, while that thing is obviously self adjoint, this guy isn't. This is anti self adjoint. When you take star, you get a minus sign. But you can fix that just by putting an, an i there and a minus i here. <laughs> okay? So obviously those cancel. But it means that this bit here now is self adjoint. When you take the star of it, it's equal to itself. Okay, so we just wrote an arbitrary bounded operator as a linear combination of two self adjoints. And so then we can prove the theorem by saying that every self adjoint is a linear combo of two unitaries. And the way that you do this is um, you just use the fact that uh, we can write. We can write x. Oh, uh, so let me give myself a little bit of time. Sorry. So we can write the identity function x as the following little guy here. You can write it as um, x plus uh, i times square root of 1 minus x squared plus 1 half x minus i square root 1 minus x squared. Okay? So, uh, and let, let's, let's just do this on, on the interval from minus one to one. And this, this matters here, uh, because to use this argument here, what you should do is use your, take your self adjoint operator, scale it so it has norm less than one, so its spectrum is actually contained in here, then do this argument, and then you can rescale up your answer to get what you want. And now the point is that, so you've got this, just because these both cancel. These are both continuous functions here, so we can apply these, uh, uh, both of these functions to our self adjoint T. But the point is that uh, these functions here, 1 half x plus or minus i square root 1 minus x squared, uh, they both map interval from minus 1 to 1 to the unit circle in the complex plane. Yeah, that's the point on the unit circle. And then a theorem very much like this one. Uh, is that, um, uh, although this is much harder to see, I can see this easily. Okay, well, so the lemma, which I'm not going to prove today, uh, but is similar in spirit to this one, um, is that uh, an operator u is unitary. much easier than this. Okay, the lemma that's easier to prove and truer uh, is that f of t is unitary if and only if uh, the range of t sits in, uh, sits in the unit circle. Uh, what I wanted to say was that, if the, if the, that you're unitary exactly if your spectrum is in the unit circle, but you probably have to add an adjective about no 
I don't know, four here. Okay, but this lemma is actually pretty easy to prove directly, and it's the sort of thing that might be on the fourth assignment if I hadn't really written it, um, or uh, it's a good exam question, that sort of thing, um, and that 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 combined with this decomposition here shows you how that is as the new composition for human genes. Um, there are a few more applications listed at the end of the notes on spectral theory. Most of the other ones, I think, are hopefully pretty doable also as a consequence of the spectral theory. But okay, let's be done with that for now. Um, and we'll start doing Barnax places next week. See you all then. So what will we yeah. do tomorrow? Or? Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're waiting for the whole lecture. The <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, so inward bound is a race that the colleges organize, where uh, in, in its original inception back in the 70s or something, um, they drove everyone out in vans in the middle of the night to the bush, dropped people off, and, they and told them, first people back to Bruce Wynn, uh, but the point is they don't tell you where you are when you get dropped off. So between like first or Bruce and... Yes, yeah, so all the colleges do it, but also, I mean, do the non-residential college does it does as well. Does Graduate House do it as well? What's that? Graduate House? No. 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 They could if they wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's where I live, and I, I hadn't heard of this. <laughs> tell, 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 tell people yeah. to make it happen. Uh, okay. These days, the end point is no longer back on campus because it's too complicated doing it in the city. The, the end point is out in the bush somewhere. That's pretty good. But, uh, yeah. The, the math department put in a faculty team last year for the first time that there was a faculty team in for decades. And we wanted to put another one in this year, but then all of the faculty turned out to be old and lame. But instead, <laughs> a bunch of the undergrads from the Master Department are running before the Master Department this year.